The House barely approving a defense policy bill known as the National Defense Authorization Act today. In a normal world, this passes with widespread bipartisan support. But today, it barely squeaked by and did so mostly along party lines after Republicans loaded it with divisive amendments on restricting abortion access, eliminating diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and staff from the Pentagon, and banning some health care programs for transgender people. The bill, as it stands, is going to die in the Democratic-controlled Senate. It's almost certain. But it does raise major questions tonight of what Congress is actually going to be able to pass in the end. Joining me now for a perspective on this is Congresswoman Nancy Mace of South Carolina, a Republican who voted for the bill despite blasting her colleagues for some of those amendments that were added. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Today, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy claimed he is not being driven to the right by his members, but he says he's simply allowing the House to work its will. Do you agree with that? Um, well, from my perspective, representing a very middle ground kind of district, uh, I would believe otherwise um, with this bill. And it was one of the more partisan NDAAs that we've had. But when the bill goes to the Senate, we all know that a lot of those amendments will get thrown out by the Senate because the majority is a different makeup than it is in the House. Yeah, but speaking of the amendments, yeah, it, what passed today is not what it's going to look like in the end. Right. But people did still have to vote for it, which was of concern, I know, for people who are in districts uh, like yours. You have repeatedly spoken out on your party's stance on abortion. And you said yesterday, and I'm quoting you now, that your party <laughs> needs to stop being assholes to women. So why did you vote for this today? Well, I was looking at the policy, the consistent, I want to be consistent on military policy and whether travel, because this is very specific to travel, the military does not pay for abortion services at all. But this was strictly related to travel. And the military does not, in any other case, reimburse for travel expenses for elected procedures. Now, I, I didn't like, I did not like the idea of this amendment. These are not issues that I believe we should be voting on right now without some consideration of what we can do to protect women and show that we're pro-women, which has been my frustration for the better part of the last seven months. And Caitlin, in fact, I filed an amendment this week for the bill that said for the, the same amount of funding that we would the military would spend on travel reimbursement for women traveling out of the state, that the same amount would be spent for women who chose to have their baby, giving them prenatal care, maternal care, doula care, et cetera, just trying to show that there's a there's a balancing act here. We can be pro-woman and pro-life. And the, the amendment was ruled out of order. And I have deep frustrations about the way things went down this week. But to the Pentagon policy, you're right that it is mm -hmm. not paying for the procedure, something right. that we talked about with Senator Turberville earlier this week. But also, when you look at this, a woman service member who's stationed at Fort Drum in upstate New York, for example, has more access to abortion services and reproductive health options. A woman who's stationed at Fort Hood in Texas has to travel to get those same services. Do you think that's fair? Well, it doesn't, nothing in here would prohibit a woman from traveling out of state to follow state law. And so I think that's, you know, a really important message. Nothing would prohibit her from being able to do that. There are no limits on her travel. One of the other concerns the rumor was this week that they were going to limit a medical, uh, the be able to, the recovery time after having this kind of service. And uh, that was really, that was something I was very concerned about. And I was grateful to see that that was not in there and that there were exceptions for rape, incest, life of the mother, and also no reporting requirements. And so that's something else that I have been uh, screaming from the rooftops that we cannot do to women in these situations. Right. It, it doesn't prevent them, of course, right. from going and getting the procedure. But if you're in the middle of Texas and you've got to get a flight to a state where you can get an abortion, it's different than if you're someone who is in New York or somewhere where you can get one. And of course, as you know, these service members don't decide where they're stationed. If they're in my home state of Alabama, uh, it's virtually inaccessible. Right. But the, but unfortunately, with the military, just that's not the standard protocol for reimbursements for travel. Um, these votes aren't easy. I, I Not everyone's going to agree with all of us on all of our votes, but I take every one of these seriously. And I'm trying to be very thoughtful and purposeful. And I also want to be consistent about military policy. And that's very important to me. But also at the same time, you know, showing that, hey, I have this other amendment that shows we can be pro-women and pro-life at the same time. And then to see it just thrown out at the last minute, um, for me as a female lawmaker, as a mom, as a, as, a, as a woman, it's very frustrating to see that it's just a different standard. There was another moment last night as all of these amendments were being debated where your Republican colleague, Eli Crane, was arguing for the passage of his amendment to prohibit the Pentagon from requiring diversity training when he made this comment. My amendment has nothing to do with whether or not colored people or black people or anybody can serve. 
okay? It has nothing to do with color Mr. Of your Speaker, skin. I'd like to be recognized to have the words colored people stricken uh, from the record. I find it offensive and very inappropriate. I should note that he later apologized, but is that acceptable language from one of your colleagues? Well, I'm glad to see that he apologized because racism of any kind uh, should never be tolerated. And it's something that I have condemned for a lifetime. I come from South Carolina where we had a, a white supremacist uh, kill, shoot and kill nine black church members at Mother Emanuel. And so I, I want to be very clear that racism of any kind, by any party, by anybody of any color, should always be condemned. Um, in any way, shape, or form. And I'm glad that he apologized and took responsibility for those comments, and we can all move forward from here. Congresswoman Nancy Mace, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. For more perspective on what's happening in Washington, I want to bring in Admiral Mike Mullen, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Admiral Mullen, thank you for being here tonight. I don't have to tell you, you know the NDAA sets Pentagon policy and spending limits for the year ahead, and normally it, it passes with widespread bipartisan support so I wonder what goes through your mind and maybe the mind of others who are at the Pentagon now when you see this bill being loaded with all of these social policy provisions from Republicans. Well, I think it, it really hurts the military from a, from a reputation standpoint. Uh, it hurts it from a readiness standpoint. It hurts it from a recruiting standpoint. And it hurts it from a retention standpoint. Uh, this bill, as you've said, Caitlin, normally passes with significant bipartisan support. I think it is reflective of the political environment uh, and actually to continue to politicize the military and put it right into the middle of all the politics uh, actually is something that we, we, those of us who served and those who are leading now uh, want to stay as far away from as possible. So it's a very, very difficult and quite frankly challenging time for our military and our military leadership. Well, and speaking of that, Senator Tommy Tuberville was on the show earlier this week. He has continued his hold on hundreds of military nominations in protest of that policy that I was just talking about there with Congresswoman Mace. He has a new op-ed out today, and this is quoting from it. He says, politicizing the military would be a tragedy in any country, but it is especially tragic because the American military is the last non-political institution in our public life. Given those words from the senator, do you believe he's the one politicizing the military? Now, I believe very strongly he's doing the exactly that, Caitlin. He's putting the military right in the middle of the abortion debate. And, and if his principle is certainly to uh, support, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the abortion issue from his perspective, uh, that's fine. And, and he can represent uh, his constituents in that regard. But what he's doing is he's putting the military right in the middle of politics, which is historically something you know we've worked hard to stay out of, uh, as well as many on the Hill have kept us out of that as well. So he's actually doing the exact opposite uh, of, uh, of what he says he's doing. Um, uh, he's, as you know, he's holding up many, many appointments. That's gonna have a compounding effect on leadership. It's gonna have a huge effect on families, families that are trying to move kids into school, uh, family spouses who are looking for employment because they're due to move to another place. And these are families that support us uh, in everything that we do in what is a very, very difficult, challenging, and also patriotic service to our country. My colleague, Haley Britsky, who's at the, the Pen she's a Pentagon producer for CNN, she took this picture of the Joint Chiefs headshots at the Pentagon. Of course, you're the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Your photo used to be right up there at the top. What is it like for you to look at that and to see that empty space where the Marine Commandant should be but is not because he can't get confirmed because of this hold? Well, he's the first uh, of many, quite frankly, because uh, if the hold continues, uh, each service chief uh, and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, those positions will not be filled or they will be filled by uh, temporary or acting individuals. And acting is one of the least popular uh, descriptions of, of any office in Washington because you, you know that that individual is not going to be there for very long. So it just has this compounding effect. And, and I think the number by the end of the year, if he keeps it up, is his holds 
uh, which are now affecting, I think, 250 uh, or so mm -hmm. uh, officers will be upwards of, you know, 650, which is 89 percent or close to 90 percent of our flags and who lead the greatest military in the world at a really critical time when we're facing increasing challenges from China uh, and, and a significant challenge from Russia. It's as, it's as challenging a time from that perspective as I've seen in many decades. What, what goes through your mind when he makes comments like there's too many admirals and too many generals anyway at the top? Um, I mean, that, that I think the number that we have is 850. We need that leadership. That's not a new criticism, quite frankly. Uh, I, he's, I don't think his stated goal is to get rid of admirals and generals. Uh, I think it really is to try to win on the political side here. At a time when that kind of initiative, this kind of initiative from his perspective, impacts the trust level in the United States military.